In fact, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we thank you, Lord, because you're relentless to get us healed. You're relentless to get us whole. We thank you, Father God, for this opportunity to come to you together as a body and praise and worship you in song. And now we get to praise and worship you in the word. So, Father, minister to us through your word, Father God. We thank you, God, that this is all you, Father. It's your word, and it's just a man speaking it, but it's your word, and it, that it will pierce the hearts of the people, and they will just come to know you if they don't know you, and if they do know you, Lord, that they will just repent of things, that they will acknowledge things that aren't of you in their lives, and that they will cast them off, Father, and they will turn another way to follow you, Lord. We thank you for what your son did, and it's in his mighty name we come to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, today, I titled this Sequel. Sequel. And I wasn't sure what came to mind, and then I, I had asked my wife, and she wasn't home. I think it was Thursday or Friday. I texted her and said, hey, I, I'm going to title this Sequel, and then she didn't respond for a while, and then it came to me, and I was like, wait, 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 wait. Like a movie set would sink in that that's a sequel. Like, so... That's what this is. It's a sequel. And today we're going to look in the book of Acts. And this was the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. So it's kind of like the follow-on. And it's when this whole thing started that we're participating in right now is church. This is the sequel to the resurrection. And it's called the church. All right? And the church has its formation based on what we read in Scripture here. And guidance, and it's referred to in the Bible, it's called the five-fold ministry mandate that the New Testament church was to follow. Now, many of you have heard this that have come here, but I like to use the hand to describe the five-fold ministry. Because there's five parts to our, there's five fingers there in our hand. And so, each of these represent part of this five-fold mandate. So the thumb, this, the thumb touches all, and it's the strongest, and the thumb is the apostle okay so the apostle is like all of these it, the apostle is the prophet is the evangelist is the is the pastor and is the teacher and it touches all of them then you have the index finger the, this finger it it points the way like we point we'll, we'll put our finger like this and we point well that's the prophet the prophet points the way okay and that's the index finger then you have the middle finger it's the longest finger and that finger refers to the evangelist because the evangelist reaches out the farthest. They really go out there. And sometimes they're, they got to do it on their, on their own. And, and in its extension, the evangelist isn't safe. So that's why it has to be sandwiched between the prophet and then this baby, which is the pastor. The ring finger. The ring finger. Because the pastor is married to the local assembly. Jesus is the great shepherd. And he's married. We're going to marry him, okay? And this finger also, if you weren't aware, is the most sensitive finger, okay? And then finally, you have this little baby, the pinky. This is the teacher because it's the only one that fits in your ear, okay? Now, you've heard me do that before um, if you've been here, but I want to look at Scripture today. Today, I kind of want to focus on how the church began and it focuses on this baby, the thumb, the apostle, the apostolic team as we're going to be introduced to them. And I hope it'll help us to glean a better understanding of our assignment, okay? Because we each have assignments while we're here. Now, some of the names of these first people, these apostles, were Barnabas and, and Saul, who his name gets changed to Paul. And then you have Peter and John and some of the other first Disciples were the initial apostles, right? These guys were, would face false prophets, demonic guards, and territorial opposition in the ministry as they went out. So we're going to pick it up today with Barnabas and Paul entering the apostolic dimension when they're sent out from the local church in Antioch in Syria. Okay, and it's around 45 AD. Now, let's just pause there for a moment. We've I think sometimes we get confused as to how things manifested, or we think they're just like a snap of the finger, like microwave. Well, Jesus is, is crucified, buried, and resurrected, and he ascends, and it's about 15 years later 
where we're going to be talking today. When they, when it's Acts chapter 13, is about 15 years after Jesus ascends. Okay, so so the book of Acts is chrono, is a chronological like list, and it's going in order of what's going on since Jesus ascends, and and Peter is kind of talked about mainly in the first 12 chapters. And now chapter 13, it starts with Paul, okay? And also to make note, while they're going out here, is we're going to read that this guy, like sometimes in the Bible he's referred to as John Mark, sometimes John, but you and I know him as Mark. He accompanies them. Let's pick this up in Acts chapter 13, verse 5. When they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. That John right there is not John the Baptist. He's not John who wrote the Gospel of John and one of the disciples. No, this is Mark. Some Bibles may call it right there, John Mark went as their assistant. This version says John, but it's really Mark. Okay, and he wrote the Gospel of Mark. And he was a little bit younger than all the other guys, I guess. Right? He, his mother was, was named Mary, and she was a prominent woman in Jerusalem where many believers gathered during Peter's imprisonment by Herod Agrippa, who was also, okay, and also Mark is the cousin of Barnabas. All right? Now, this is what's neat about this guy, Mark, because I think a lot of us can relate to him. Mark's ministry, like how it started, was a lot like yours and, and mine. He joined Barnabas and Paul after delivering famine relief for those in the Jerusalem church. He was giving people food, right? He's doing outreach. And in, and in his ministry, and, and I think some of the other ministry assignments that he did probably were like this. He probably met the personal needs of the team. He was probably praying, part of the intercessory prayer team and involved in missions. He was probably making travel arrangements, securing food and lodging, and he probably was even beginning to do some preaching. He'd have opportunities. I'm just telling you, if you ever do outreach, your opportunities to preach the Word of God are really ripe. Okay, so hopefully you can relate to that. It was, in other words, a time of training for him and, and development for Mark. So we read that Barnabas, Paul, and Mark begin what is commonly referred to as Paul's first missionary journey. And this is the first recorded apostolic team sent on assignment from this church in Antioch that we read in, at, at the beginning of Acts 13. Now, you've got to also remember, up to this point, the spreading of the gospel, like I said, from Jesus' ascension to this time, which is about 15 years, okay, had been only through result of persecution. But now the advancement of the gospel is going to be by apostolic design, Apostolic ministry, folks, is strategic and it's impacting. So, and see, we might have glossed over this already, but half of the world's population are what we would call in cities. I refer to them as gateway cities when I'm in the New Testament. And see, gateway cities are not all, you know, recognized not only by a large population, but equally significant is their influence in the nation, in the culture. And this can be measured in a multitude of ways. Some are like because of commerce, economics, travel, historic significance of the city, cultural and musical influence, because everybody comes there, and so you, the culture and you have a great influence because there's a lot of people there, right? And, of course, don't ever forget education. And then the reality is, you know, there's politics go on in those areas. So just like we read in our Bibles about this spreading of the gospel initiative via apostolic design, you and I should see this continuing today. It, shouldn't, it didn't just end. It's supposed to continue to today. And, and apostolic ministries are churches of influence in an area. Apostles are like spiritual architects and master builders that carry a very strong governing authority. All right? Now, reading in the book of Acts allows us to track their travels, and this first team of apostles traveled toward the seacoast town of Seleucia, this is all in our Bibles, when, then sailed on to Barnabas' homeland, which is Cyprus. So they're kind of in Syria, in the inner part of the country of Syria, which is just north of Israel. Okay? Then they go to this town, they head towards the coast of Seleucia, then they could probably catch a boat and just cross over to Cyprus, which was Barnabas' homeland. 
And Cyprus is kind of like a hub for international trade and everything, travel, and as well as then it, should, it will be a spiritual hub, okay? And, and what they did was these guys arrived at these cities they would go on and they'd preach the word of God in the Jewish synagogues first. This was the established pattern of ministry. This is exactly what Jesus did. He preached to the Jews first, but then something happened. Then something happened. If we, if we just would jump ahead a little bit, a few verses in Acts chapter 13, we find that Paul and Barnabas preaching the gospel to the Jews in the territory known as Pisidia. It's in current day Turkey, right? And there was a town there also called Antioch. Don't get this confused with the other Antioch that we began Acts chapter 13 with, okay? So they're in this town of Antioch and, and they're preaching at the synagogue and the Jews are loving it, man. They're like, oh my gosh, this is really good teaching. But there's a bunch of Gentiles there that are also enjoying this teaching. So they're like, can you keep doing this? It says they leave like church that day. And Paul and Barnabas are just having, a, they're probably having fellowship, having some food. So it turns, it's the next week. And, and so they gather at the synagogue. It's the Sabbath. And the crowd, it says like the, most of the city shows up. And Paul and Barnabas are doing what they do, sharing the word of God, and all of a sudden, some of the Jews are starting to get jealous at that Paul and Barnabas are sharing the truth, truths about the gospel, to the Gentiles. And so then what happens is some of these Jews are so upset, they start contradicting, contradicting and opposing what Paul and Barnabas were teaching. Okay? Now here's the reply to the Jews that Paul and Barnabas give. It's Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul, Paul, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. He's speaking to the Jews, okay? But since you reject it and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. I mean, that's pretty harsh. So, so, so even though, grasp this, even though Paul and Barnabas like are saying here that stop talking to the Jews, please don't misunderstand this. This does not mean we don't evangelize to the Jews. We evangelize to the entire world for whoever has ears to hear. Okay? So returning back now to the beginning of the book of Acts uh, chapter 13, when Paul and Barnabas and Mark stopped in Cyprus, we find the apostolic team meeting very heavy spiritual warfare and occult opposition. I would contend it's probably very similar to what's been going on the last few days down at the Orange Park market, parking lot. If you're aware of what's going on down there, right? So here they are in Paphos, which is the capital city of Cyprus, and they face this sorcerer who is called Bar-Jesus. The name also translates to Elamas. He was a prophetic mystic, false prophet, and he's Jewish, okay? And also note that within this city of Paph Paphos was the great temple of the goddess Aphrodite, the, the goddess of Jezebel. So let me just quickly state an important note to never forget. False prophets, religious spirits, and the spirit of Jezebel will be the three main demonic spirits that oppose the church in the last days. Those three spirits is what really will contend with the church of Jesus Christ. Okay? Apostolic teams must be prepared to meet these demonic territorial representatives. See, apostolic teams have the grace and anointing on their lives that can spiritually see these dark territorial rulers that have manifested. Something that is difficult to process for many is that apostles are not peacemakers when it comes to spiritual opposition. They are instruments of God to challenge demonic strongholds. That is one of their assignments. Is like they can't look the other way. They can't just say, I don't want to deal with that. No, that is a, you are a very vehicle and a tool that God put there to knock that and stuff off. Okay? It's like, think about when Jesus was in the temple, those two times, two different times we have him turning over the tables. He was showing some righteous anger. This is something today that unfortunately confuses Christians mainly because they haven't been taught about this, so that's one of the reasons I'm teaching you this. And the other reason it's very, like, maybe confusing for a lot of Christians is they've been taught a watered-down, mushy-gushy, cuddly gospel. 
The whole objective of spiritual warfare is to remove hindrances to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? But many times, there has to be some spiritual warfare to bind the demonic. So we pick it back up here in Acts chapter 13, verse 6. They had gone through the isle onto Paphos. They found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. This is what I was just telling you about. See, satanic government's purpose, the counterfeit of the Lord, okay? Their entire purpose is to influence and deceive elected officials, deceive the leaders, okay? The demonic seeks, seeks, it's looking for positions of power and influence, and the only way it gets, a, it gets a hand in this is if the individual that's in that position submits to the demonic. That's what goes on, right? See, so this false prophet, Elamas, was influencing Sergius Paulus, who is the selected, he's put there as the Roman ruler of the island of Cyprus, because remember, the Romans ruled all this territory. So he's like the Pontius Pilate of Cyprus, okay? Now, remember that when an apostolic church or an apostolic leader encounters this demonic stronghold in an area or in a territory or in a city, they are the ones that are called and are divinely equipped to hit back at Satan's leadership. And unfortunately, again, I have to say this, some have a hard time dealing with the fallout from this divinely inspired encounter. It's like a battle going on. Okay? This is just another example that I need to show you where people are confused when God shows up. I mean, see, this is God showing up and people freak out. Like, like let me tell you another wonderful example of God showing up. There were these people that were told, uh, I guess around 120 of them were told to go to Jerusalem and wait for God. They were told to wait by Jesus. He said, go there and wait. 500 heard it, but only 120 went. So they're waiting, they're waiting. Ooh, that's right there. That'll preach. It's in the waiting. So they're waiting. And all of a sudden, just think about those people there in that room. Wouldn't you think somebody might have said, hey, hey, you got like some fire on your head. Well, I don't. And the other guy's like, no, I don't. Yeah, you got fire on your head. Wait, you got fire on your head too. What? Boom, shakalaka, they get, they shake, they name, they get, do what, they say, they left, but they... And they start speaking in an unknown language. They go, what did you just say? I don't know. They walk outside and all the people started to understand them. And God showed up and people freaked out. What did they say? They're drunk. You ever seen drunk? I've seen drunk. I've been drunk. Drunk's the same everywhere. But that's what's going on. God showed up. And people that want to look at things in the natural and said, the Bible says that it came from heaven. Sound came from heaven. But they're using earthly things to judge things from heaven. How silly. Does this make sense? Okay, good. I can tell now that you're starting to smell what I'm cook. All right? So in this encounter now, God's going to show up. Okay? And, and Elimas is about to meet his match. We're shown multiple times in Scripture where they are to oppose, like apostles are to oppose demonic territorial guards as one of their assignments. Apostles have to do this, or the very people under their care will suffer. Let me say that again. If apostles don't do this, the very people under their care will suffer, will be under a demonic influence. You can't look the other way and hope these demons go away, in other words. Let, let me, before I get into this one, let me just give you another example in Acts chapter 8. When Philip preached in Samaria... He too faced opposition from a sorcerer named Simon. Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 9. There was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. So this local guy, Simon, was very impressed Philip shows up and he becomes very impressed with the preaching of Philip and Philip talking about Jesus. And he, and he goes, I, I want to be baptized. And, and he was, he was water baptized and he joins Philip's ministry there in Samaria. Now Philip, for a reason that we, I don't know, was not able to discern the demonic spirits still operating on Simon. How can I say that? Well, we'll read on here in a little bit. 
See, Philip was fulfilling the role of the evangelist. Remember the, the finger here, the longest finger, the middle finger? He's out there, okay? He's out there. He's going out there. That's what evangelists do. You go out there, okay? Now let's read on and see how this is dealt with. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 19. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. See, they heard, they heard that, that Philip had done this, that he had been sharing the word of God. They sent Peter and John now to join them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now they're in Samaria. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit yet. The Bible says in verse 16, for, for, for as yet they had only fallen, he had fallen upon none of them, he being the Holy Spirit. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, now here's Simon again, he's, he, he's claimed to receive Jesus, all this stuff, he's been bat water baptized. When Simon saw through the laying on of the hands of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's break this down a bit and what's going on. This guy, Simon, is a false prophet who was able to attach himself to Philip's ministry. Why? Philip's the evangelist. He's out there far, far, and he's calling back, and he's like, hey, can somebody else come down here? And he doesn't even really know what's going on, but he's doing what an evangelist is supposed to do. Okay? See, and it's very common for evangelists to attract people with selfish ambition to latch on to their ministries. Simon's heart was not right, and it only became exposed or it was only able to be seen in the presence of the apostolic team. In this case, it was Peter and John. Simon is very impressed what's going on, and he notices something happened when the apostles laid their hands on the believers. These people spoke in other tongues and prophesied. That's the only thing that could, because up to this point, we didn't know the Holy Spirit was given, and, and we see it in Acts chapter 2, and then this is going on, and now this is Acts chapter 8, and... and the, they, Simon saw something. How did, how, what did he see? He, he heard the people speaking in tongues and they're prophesying. So what happens? Simon pulls all it, out of his wallet and he's, and he's really excited. He says, hey, sell me your secret. Show me how you did that. How much do you want for this? Name your price. That's what's going on. So Peter and John were able to see what Philip could not and the apostle Peter revealed Simon's motives and rebuked him. Acts chapter 8, verses 20 and 23. Peter said to Simon, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. In other words, what's going on here, apostles will confront those demonic territorial guards. In many parts of the world, false personal prophecy and judgmental cursing by spirits of divination are confusing the body of Jesus Christ by mystifying the purpose of prophetic ministry. Prophetic ministry is not mystical, it's not confusing, it's not ambiguous, it's not self-serving, it's not enchanting, or it's not bewitching. If it is, it's not prophecy, it's sorcery. Many modern sorcerers have hijacked the prophetic ministry of, of the great I am. The restoration of the apostolic church will bring fearless men who will not tolerate these demonic wizards that some label as God's prophets. I had to say that. You got to hear this. And it's for our good. Because we got to be taught it. So we understand the whole flow and how everything works together. So returning back to our team of Paul and Barnabas heading into this gateway city of Cyprus for the purpose now of bringing the gospel, let's see what happens. Now again, now on the island of Paphos is Sergius Paulus, and he wanted to hear, this Roman leader, the, and the, like the mayor of the city or the governor, however you want to look at it, he wanted to hear the word of God, and he's the one who called for Barnabas and Paul to come and share. Look at this, Acts chapter 13, verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. I had already read this. Here's the next verse. Who was, the, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. So Elamas was a demonic guard that wished to keep the governor of the island from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He opposed, Elamas opposed 
Paul and Barnabas. Here's the next verse, verse 8. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated. Remember, it was Bar-Jesus. Isn't that tricky? The real Jesus has already been there. But you see, again, how many people in that area could be confused when you say Jesus because it was a common name. Okay, I don't want to get off track here because I had a tendency to do that at times. But I'm just trying to share with you there. All right? So Elamus the sorcerer withstood uh, Barnabas and Paul, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the face. So he's wanting this mayor. He goes, hey, don't listen to those knuckleheads. Right? Now the Greek word withstood is anthistami, meaning to set against to withstand, to resist, to intensely oppose. This reveals Elimas's satanic objectives, which is to guard the territory against Jesus Christ's truth, to keep the people in spiritual ignorance, to influence the governing leadership, to oppose the ministers of Jesus Christ, to turn hearts away from Jesus Christ and his truth. This guy, Elimas, postured himself as a prophetic voice to deceive the people. He's a voice, no doubt, but it's a demonic voice, okay? Facing one another in fierce opposition were God's apostolic team, Paul and Barnabas, and Satan's territorial representative, Elimas. Governing authority, if you will, versus governing authority. So Elimas cha challenged Barnabas and Paul, just like the magicians did in Pharaoh's court, withstood Moses and Aaron, if you remember that. Right? Scripture describes demonic guards as those that resist truth with corrupt minds concerning the faith. Scripture makes clear that there are unseen battles raging in the spirit realm for the souls of mankind. Apostolic teams, however, are God's battle axe, if you will, to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of the gospel. Apostolic teams are the very vehicles assigned by God to face these demonic guards, to claim new territories for Jesus Christ, to restore the forgotten truth, to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, to encourage the receiving of spiritual gifts that God has imparted to Christians, recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to demonstrate the kingdom of God that it is here, to spearhead gospel operations, to equip believers for battle and victorious occupation, to teach people about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's just a few of the things. Hallelujah. And furthermore, apostolic leaders are not ignorant to the devil's devices and have been gifted by God to see beyond the natural and into the spiritual. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians chapter 6, right? So we read how Paul deals with Elimas. Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he sets his eyes on this guy, right? Paul was not trying to be a nice statement, statesman for Jesus when dealing with a false prophet. This is what freaks some people out sometimes, okay? Like, it's, it, it, but it has to happen. If it's going to be in public, it's going to be in public, Okay? Paul calls Elamas a child of the devil and an enemy of righteousness. Now this, folks, is what we would see. This would be called Holy Ghost boldness and apostolic authority and demonstration. And this can be extremely intimidating if this is your first time witnessing it. Now let's read what happens here in Acts chapter 13, starting with verse 9. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at Elamas and said... O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on Elamas, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Wow, this isn't as bad, though, as that couple we read about in uh, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Well, I look at that. They were Christians following, right? And they got struck dead. And people go, God is all full of grace in the New Testament. He struck a couple people dead that were followers. Don't mess with the Lord. Do not play games with the Lord, right? This is a demonstration here of the Spirit of God that sends this apostolic team into the battle. Paul is empowered by the anointing on his life and the will of God locked in and targeted on Elimas, resulting in temporary blindness, blindness for this false prophet. Paul kind of further, as he wrote like half of the New Testament, 
He expands on these types of encounters while writing to the Corinthian church, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting with verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So in other words, these churches, the Corinthian church, the church in Thessalo Thessalonia, you know, the General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Pro um, um, Philippians, thank you, Colossians. I mean, you remember those little acronyms to help you. All of these churches started after this trip. This is when they started. So, like, if you're thinking the churches started right after Jesus said, see, uh, I'm going to go back and make a place for you, and I'll be back later. They didn't. It was a couple of decades, okay, just so you get a perspective. Like, some of us have such a hard time. There he is. It's in the waiting. What are you doing in the waiting? Are you cursing in the waiting? Then you're going to be waiting a long time. It's in the waiting. He's cooking us. Okay? He's testing us. He loves us. Right? See, we can, stand, we can stand in any battle because Scripture tells us we can. Look what Mark now writes uh, right after Jesus. This was from the Gospel of Mark. Now remember, Mark's witnessing this as a young Christian. He witnesses this. So at the end of Mark's Gospel, here's what he writes in Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere. He's talking about the disciples. He's talking about the apostles. They went forth and preached everywhere, the, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Right? So this Roman deputy, Paulus, witnessed God's apostolic power and manifestation and believed in the doctrine of the Lord. It wasn't just the power demonstration that turned this deceiver's, deceived ruler's heart toward Jesus, but the teaching of sound doctrine. Bible tells us in Acts 13, verse 12, then the proconsul believed. This guy, Sergius Paulus, believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So this encounter with the first apostolic team revealed the teachings of Jesus Christ converting the governor of the city, this Roman guy. Now this may seem kind of like a lot, since it was not the normal, simple ABCs of Christianity, admit, believe, confess. All right? I, I want to make sure that I bring this a little bit closer so we grasp this. So I just got real with myself. I imagine many of you, like me, growing up, or wherever you're at in your journey, you believed in a spiritual reality, and even from your earliest memories, you were on a conscious and concerted, you know, a just concerted search for God. But frankly, what happened to me, and I think many of us, religion, as we witnessed growing up, we thought could have, would have been the last place I would have thought that I could find God. Churches and cathedrals seem more like prisons where people were held hostage and God was held for ransom. Behind the piety of the stained glass masquerade and the pews were the bars and chains of guilt and shame. It makes me think of a comedy skit from about 30 years ago now called The Church Lady. Saturday Night Live didn't make up The Church Lady, The Church did. Dana Carvey just borrowed her from the church, right? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, if you're too young, go, go YouTube it. You can see a lot of the church lady. See, somehow we've allowed ourselves to become a poor imitation of the real thing. Many want to break free from the prison that bears the name of Jesus Christ and uses the Bible to hold people captive. So I want to explain this like this, and I'm going to use the animal kingdom. There's a difference between lions and tigers. It's, it's that lions are more easily domesticated than tigers. The reason is that lions hunt only for the purpose of eating. Hunting for a lion is motivated by hunger. Tigers are different. Tigers hunt for the shrill, sheer thrill of the chase. When your pleasure is the hunting and not just the eating, it's much more difficult to be domesticated. Right? In other words, now you've got to understand, I'm talking about this, using this example, but this is a spiritual connotation you've got to grasp, right? In other words, all you have to do is keep a lion fed, and you'll likely be safe. A tiger, though, is always ready to involve you in the game of tag. Okay? Think about this as, a, as your Christian walk now. Okay? 
at the most basic level, this is supposed to be the difference between Christianity and all other religions, right? Other religions hunt for the purpose of survival. They are desperately trying to appease God. All their efforts, all their energy are motivated by fear and guilt and the unsatisfied hunger of their souls, just like a lion. Now contrast that with a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, who should be more like tigers. The thrill is the hunt. What I mean is, Christians, we've met God. We've tasted deeply of Him. We are not trapped in some endless effort to earn God's love and secure our place in the afterlife. Right? We've found freedom because of what Jesus did. And in Him, we're to be fully alive. Our faith is not motivated by a desperate effort to satisfy God, but by the unspeakable pleasure of knowing God. See, you can train a tiger, but you can't tame a tiger. God never intended to tame us, but to unleash an untamed faith. See, each one of us will face the temptation of choosing to become domesticated like a lion. A raw faith is always undomesticated. It's always primal. The best parallels I, think, I can think of to describe our potential domestication and need to rediscover our primal faith, I find in mythology. Now, I want to ask the band to make their way back to the stage. Romulus and Remus, they were raised by wolves and later became the founders of Rome. These are myths, okay? But I like this correlation that it came up with. Rudyard Kipling's Mowgli from the Jungle Book, okay, was lost in the jungle and also raised by wolves. Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan was lost in the wild and raised by apes. All of these guys were raised in the wild and found themselves untamed in the midst of civilization. Even when they learned how to survive and even thrive among the civilized, it was never possible to fully domesticate them. There was always something wrong and untamed about who they were. They were fully human, but their real nature had been awakened, and it could never be put to sleep. That's the Holy Spirit in us. It's been awakened. Though they dressed like gentlemen, there was always the look of the wild in their eyes. Even when they found their places among the civilized, there was always a sense that they belonged to the wild and to live anywhere else was they'd be out of place. There are some things once born in us that are impossible to reverse. Once you're born again, you can't reverse it. But for many of us, it's just lying dormant. See, it's not, it's not that they have control over us, it's that they always shape who we are. Superficial changes are easily discarded. Eternal changes, however powerful, can eventually be broken. These mythical examples each allude to an unleashing of something deep within the human soul waiting to be awakened. In some ways, these stories hold a hope that somewhere deep within us lies a divine potential to become more than we are when we simply conform. It is possible that only God can awaken a humanity greater than what we've created together. I hope we believe that. It's only God who can do it. It is a hope, folks, that if somehow we unlock our souls and unleash our faith, we could become what we were generally, genuinely created to be. We were made a spirit in the beginning. Each of these examples point to a longing that resides in all of us to find the untamed way out of civilization. Which is exactly where I found myself shortly after receiving Jesus Christ and being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was untamed. It's like, man, I'm so hungry for this word of God, I'm not gonna do it any way anybody else has done it. But I would sit under teaching and listen God gave each one of us specific giftings. The world will try to tame your giftings because they're using an earthly understanding of a heavenly thing. Oh, this can get real uneasy because you're not sure. You know what? You're right. Just like when we first learned to walk, we didn't know what we were doing. First time we were swimming, we took in a lot of water. First time riding a bike, we got a lot of scraped knees. First time driving a car, hopefully you did it in an open parking lot. You know what I'm saying? 
This is the same way. Are you going to get up and go ahead and participate and participate in what God gave you to do? Or are you going to sit there and just act like you're not hungry anymore? Folks, the entire reason that God became a man, went on a cross, shed his blood, got ripped his back open, died, was so that you could have a relationship with the Father and get the, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus resurrects and he goes, I'm going so that the Comforter will come. Comforter's here. You got to want more. You got to want more. You got to repent. You got to want more. I'm going to ask you all to come to your feet. Communion's in the back. Don't miss out on participating. Find out what your spiritual gifts are. Come next Sunday after church. We'll give you the spiritual gift test. Don't miss this opportunity. Folks, the band's going to continue praising and worshiping and leading us. Please participate. In the name of Jesus, amen.